Good? Sun finally came out. It's a good thing. Let's stand and sing. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Good morning, Crow Hill. Wow, you guys got some of that sugar out there. Good job. Hey, um, I want to thank you. I love being part of a, a church that is generous. And last week, the youth were doing their fundraiser, selling <clears throat> different breakfast foods. You all gave $1,400 in one week, which, which totally funds the need for the youth and I asked Tana because I didn't know I was like hey is that pretty good she said no that's great it took us two weeks last year to do that so good job church way to be generous and the youth the youth both the youth and the children that, that's good investment that's good kingdom investment so well done I want to celebrate that with you second we don't just want to be a generous church we want to be a church of prayer and um, on the first Wednesday of every month right in here we just kind of circle around these front rows. Usually we got about 20 chairs. It's real laid back. But we come to seek the Lord's face, and we pray for Crow Hill. 
We pray for the community. Um, we talk to the Lord. And um, we would love to have as many of you as would like join us. We pray for about an hour. We're not real rigid with that. And if people can come for a half an hour and then they need to bounce out, we understand that. But we want to be intentional, be a people of prayer. So if you're able to join us this Wednesday after work, just show on up. The doors will be open. You're welcome to come in late. We'll be praying. I had someone ask the other week. They said, hey, listen, I don't, I don't pray so well out loud. Can I come and just listen? Yes. You know where we learn to pray? Listening. Listening. We'd love to have you join us. We want to be a people of prayer. Also, hopefully you didn't miss, we're having our min, uh, ministry and missions expo. Um, thanks to all who put together tables, and uh, I know Krista and Catherine did a whole bunch of work to make it look pretty, and a lot of fun. If you didn't catch those tables, if you didn't grab you some M&Ms, here, here, it's a little cheesy, okay? <laughs> I'm allowed a little cheese. We're calling everyone to have a ministry and a mission, whether you're a member or a tender, a ministry and a ministry. By ministry, that you're serving somewhere here on, on, on campus. And uh, a mission, you know, we do all sorts of things. We have VBS. We do an event in the fall. We go to Alamosa. We're going to Togo. We've got Bailey Days. We don't just want to be an insider church, not it's not just about us, it's about the gospel advancing. So, hey, I'm going to go ahead and let you have a seat. We've been highlighting each week when I remember I forgot last week. We're highlighting a, just a different ministry, and uh, this morning we have the Miss Susan and the children's ministry. Um, I am so thankful for both Miss Susan and uh, Miss Tana and how they love and serve both the youth and the kids were, were really blessed. So roll that video. And I'm the director of children's ministries at Crow Hill. I love working with children. I think God has given me a heart for them. And the age that I deal with is such an integral time to connect children with Jesus, to introduce Jesus to them. And I want to do everything I can to facilitate that relationship with, with their God. I think that Parents are their children's number one disciples, and so a lot of what I see as my role here is to um, partner and equip parents. And we do that through Sunday mornings, through our Facebook page, through the handouts that we give out, through our midweek program, through Sunday mornings, and vacation Bible school. One of my favorite times of the whole week is our prayer time back in children's ministry. We, the kids have a sense of safety. I believe children's ministry is an integral part of our church because it provides a place for young families to come. It, it allows our church to minister to young families and our church has the benefit of the energy and the enthusiasm and the questions that young families bring to us. Um, our volunteers are just beautiful and wonderful and reliable and they have such a heart for kids that it, it just works. It's, it's a happy and it's a safe and a meaningful place back here on Sunday mornings and everywhere throughout the week. I believe children's ministry is impacting the lives of our kids in many ways all the time. One of the little girls in our life group, I know that church is impacting her. She wanted to celebrate her birthday at life group. So not just on a Sunday morning, but all throughout the week, I believe that our kids feel safe and feel valued and feel loved. So I can see that that's how children's ministry is, is making a big impact. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Savior is love, 
My 
teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand off all on you Jesus you're my hope and stay In the book of Psalms, <clears throat> chapter 119, we won't read the whole thing. <laughs> How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness, they walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your standards. Then I shall not be ashamed. When I look upon all your commandments, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Let's pray. Father, this morning... We come and we echo the psalmist. Lord, may you ordain our steps. May we diligently pursue your will in our lives. And Lord, that's not easy. There's many things that vie for our attention. Lord, may our eye, may our focus be on you. And Lord, would you walk with us the next right step? You are the one who sees the end from the beginning. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Father, I thank you that we can rest in you. And Lord, while our souls don't naturally want to be dependent, would you shape us and mold us so that we would be content in Jesus. It's in his great name we pray. Amen. Glad you're here this morning. Take a minute and welcome someone around you. <coughs> Thank you, my friend. Good job. You did job. Krista did a great job. Thank you. I've had the uh, privilege of baptizing uh, many individuals. I was thinking through, I have baptized in a, a baptistry. We, we don't actually have one here, but that, a lot of churches will have a little tank back here. I baptized in a pool. That was hard on my back. I do remember that. I have baptized in a horse trough. Amen to that. We actually have a horse trough upstairs, so we, we can go there. And I've baptized in the Jordan River. That's cool. You can join me in February if you're interested. But you know, probably the most memorable baptism was the Sunday that I got to baptize my daughter, Sophia. She had come to accept Christ as her Savior. We had given her a little time to let that sink in and 
we were, as a dad, baptizing a daughter. Um, but what made it really interesting was my wife decided to get baptized. Now, you want to make a pastor nervous, <laughs> let him baptize his daughter and his wife. And that morning, I was a little confused, which is never good. It's never good when you're up front and you're confused. And I had the waders on. We weren't even in a river. <laughs> I had the waders on. And uh, my daughter was about that tall at the time, you know, nothing. She comes up, and the water's up to here. She's here. She's looking up at me. And I do my thing, right? <laughs> Boom. Everybody's happy. I'm happy. I'm a tear. And my wife comes down. Game on. Now I'm really nervous. <laughs> and I'm so nervous that I forgot to reposition myself because a baptistry is not a pool. It has walls. And my daughter was only this tall, and my wife is that tall. And what I should have done was take a giant step over, but I didn't. Congregation's all looking at me. I say my thing. I go down, and I really, like tell you, when the Kramers do something, we're all in, especially my wife. Like, it's... She's going down, I'm pushing her down, and I realize her head's going to hit the back of the baptistry, and I'm going to knock her out, like in front of like our entire church family. <sighs> you know, memorable is okay, but confused is not okay. Not okay. I find that there is a lot of confusion that just, are you ready, floats around when it comes to baptism. Oh, some of you are awake. First service, just shoosh. I think that it, a couple things I suspect, I won't die on these hills, I think there's poor teaching about baptism. I think there's the absence of teaching about baptism. I think that there can be an overemphasis on baptism to the detriment of Christ. You know, making a bigger deal about baptism than Jesus, something's off. We make the biggest deal about Jesus, period. The other thing, and maybe you'll agree or not, I don't need any hate mail on this. It's not that you would send hate mail. But country music has not helped the baptism scene. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> as, mu I got, I'm, uh, as much as, you know, Carrie Underwood, great. But when the phrase is changed, must be something in the water. Listen, we baptize in, like, July or August out in the river, the only thing in the water is trout, and it's not going to change you. There's nothing in the water. You just got wet. Matter of fact, I was looking for a prop this morning. I was going to get a towel. Apparently, we give you robes here because the water's so cold. Like, if you come out changed, it's just that you're not breathing for a second. That's a physical response. Another one, just for fun, I got a kick on this. Um, where's this other one? Going down to the river, going to wash my soul again. How many times do we need to wash it? <laughs> Country music's not helping us. Listen, it's fine for baptism to be memorable, but it's not okay that we are, if we are confused about it. So this morning, we're going to look at baptism. We'll simply, and we're, we're going to do an overview or a little survey, because baptism, it's all over Scripture. And we're in a sermon series called The Basics. It's good every once in a while, just go back and remind us what are the fundamentals of what we believe, what is at the core of who we are. First week, we talked about our story. It's having a relationship with Jesus before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ. I had a lady out first service. It's still not too late. You can give me your three paragraphs. Before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ. I'm collecting them, and I'm going to grade them all. Everybody's going to get an A+. Plus. That's the first thing I do. I put A++ because plus plus you had the guts to give me before Christ, coming to Christ. That's your story. That's your story. It's your story of faith. Then we looked at the kingdom, that there's something bigger going on. There is an advancement. This morning, I love that out in our lobby, that was kind of tight, wasn't it? Make us kind of bump up against each other. And I love that, you know, most of the ministries and missions were things that we do, but we, we had one or two tables that <clears throat> they're kingdom-focused. 
they're not necessarily connected here, but they're advancing the kingdom. There's, there's a big picture. It's the kingdom. Then there's the church. So we have our story. We have the kingdom. We have our church. And this morning, we're going to look at baptism, and next week, we're going to look at communion. So I want to see three things this morning together. First, I want to look at what is baptism. Second, why do we get baptized? And third, how do we approach it? How do we approach it? So I'm in Matthew. I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> we're going to look at um, the front of Matthew, and then in the second point, we're going to flip back to the end of Matthew, Matthew 28. Many of you will be familiar, but we're going to start with Matthew 3, and we're going to look at 13 through 17. And this morning is going to be a little more of a survey, just different places that we see baptism in Scripture and uh, where we can go from that. I do want to mention that this is not, we're going to read the account of Jesus' baptism. This is not the only account. Both the Gospel of Mark and Luke also have the story of Jesus' bath- his baptism, and John references it. So all four Gospels, this is an important story to the writers. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13. <clears throat> Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, say it to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for all of for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John the Baptist, permitted him, Jesus, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What is baptism? At its simplest, baptism is an identifying with or an outward confession. It is to identify with something or to outwardly confess something that is true. This is real important. I'm going to say this a couple times this morning. Baptism doesn't save you. The trout don't change you. There ain't nothing in the water. You get wet. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. But when it comes to baptism, this was a practice that the Jews practiced. They would have been very familiar with baptism. If you're new here to Crow Hill, you may be like, well, I came on the right Sunday. I don't know what baptism is. What is that? The Jews who lived during Jesus' time would have been very familiar with baptism. Matter of fact, if you have the opportunity to go in February to Israel with me, when you will see in many of the sites they will have baptismal pools carved into the rock that predated even Jesus. So for Jesus and John the Baptist, there's nothing weird going on. They understood what was going on. They didn't have country music to mess with their heads. That's all I can figure. Jesus shows up on the scene here, and what he's doing is he is identifying with John the Baptist's baptism. John was calling God's people, the nation of Israel, back to God to live for God and people were identifying with John's baptism They're saying yeah that's right you know I've been doing my own thing I'm gonna I'm gonna do what the law what they knew to be right in their pursuit of God Jesus here he doesn't need saved from anything right Jesus is the God man perfect man fully God he doesn't need saved but he chooses to be baptized. It's interesting in the text here, you know, he and John kind of have this little, no, me, me, no, I'll baptize you, and they're going back and forth. And then here, Jesus says, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It was just the right thing to do. So Jesus gets baptized. For the Jews, there were two words. One was mikvah, and it, re- the word, it means new life. It means like a, a marking, a, a, that a new life to be, to be born again. There was also the word tevela. 
tabellas the word immersion. They would have been very familiar of both this idea of a, of a new life by immersion. <clears throat> and baptism is a sign of being born again. If you remember in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Most people know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That was Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And right before, they're talking about a new birth. And Nicodemus is confused. And he's like, do I have to be born a second time from my mom? And Jesus was like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, no. There's a spiritual, this idea of being born again. It, it was there in the Jewish culture. In the Old Testament law, there was a call for ritual cleaning. If you were a leopard, and you were healed, remember? You were sent to the high priest, and what would they do? They would baptize, they would cleanse you. They would put you under the water. They had a ritual cleansing. It was a physical ritual cleansing. It's a physical act. And also, we see it as a spiritual act. When people would come to the temple, what they would do is they would cleanse themselves. This idea of being cleansed through and by water. But for Christ and for us, this is an outward sign of an inward confession that we have placed our faith in Christ, in Christ alone. That Christ has saved us, that we have accepted him as our Savior, and we are seeking to identify before both God and the community that we are a follower of his. You know, I like to say I'm sure of one person's salvation. That's mine. I've been in the pastorate long enough. Anybody who gets bumped hard enough can go jump off the cliff, right? Like, we, we've seen that. Whether they were the Lord's or not, you know, individuals can go prodigal, they can go off, they can be the lost sheep, but still his. I like what Jesus says. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me. Jesus gets his. But when it comes to baptism, sometimes people say, well, pastor, that person you're baptizing, they're a real scoundrel. <laughs> you know, I've, I've baptized teetotalers and heathens. <laughs> and you know what? You and I are no different. There's not really a spectrum. We are sinners saved by grace. We sang this morning, we are dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Guys, I don't want my righteousness to be what saves me. That, that dog don't hunt. It's Christ's righteousness. And when we are baptized, what we are doing is we're acknowledging to God it is an outward sign of an inward confession. How about with the community? It's also for us as a body. You know, you want to see a body excited? Baptize six or seven people. They get excited. Like, we'll be excited in July and August when we, just not just the people that go down in that cold water, right? They're going to be excited in one way. We're going to be happy. Because what, what the individuals are doing is they're saying, hey, I'm part of this. I believe what you believe. And when we get baptized, it's a sign to the community. One, it affirms our faith. I love seeing, it says, hey, they believe what I believe. And it also provides for accountability. You know, if you're a baby believer, <clears throat> you need help. Like, there's a lot to figure out. Like, and the community is the best place to find that. I like to call the church, I called it last week, it is the greenhouse. Sure, you can come to know Christ outside of the church. You can even grow, but if you want good soil, if you want good conditions, this is what provides it. It's us. <clears throat> so baptism is an outward sign of an inward confession both before God and before the community. Because of that, baptism is special. And uh, I have two prerequisites. I'm not sure if we talked about this when I got hired, so here we go. I may just be laying this out here for the first time, but 
as your pastor, if I get to baptize you, there's two things. First, I want to hear your story. I, 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 you, you and I will sit down, and I'm not that scary. That's my kids. I'm, my daughter said that my forehead was gleaming today in the camera. <laughs> Whatever, I'm approachable. <clears throat> I want to hear what was life before Christ. Tell me about when you came to Christ and what's life been like after. Like, I want to know that you're part of us. That's the first thing. And the second thing is churches handle baptism different. There's a lot of freedom in Scripture. I think sometimes we get a little too, and I'm like, hey, look, Scripture doesn't say it. We don't need to speak it. There are some things that we're given pretty wide parameters. You know, some churches... They've got a tank back here, and it's always full, ready to go. Like every Sunday, some of you grew up in that. Like, hey, you accepted Jesus, you go back and get in a robe, and we're going to run you through the water. <laughs> right? Anybody out there grow up and, okay, a couple of you, yeah. You know, there's, there's some, there's everything. Sometimes it's, you know, you do it special occasions once a month. You know, it's, it's up to the church. There's no stipulation there. And we don't need to be throwing stones. You know what I like at Crow Hill? We baptize once or twice a year. And we eat, I think we eat food. Do we eat food, somebody? Okay, thank you. Yeah, like we want to eat food. So we baptize in July and August, and we like to put you, I am super excited to baptize. I've not baptized in the Platte River yet. Yeah, well, look, I went looking for a prop this morning. I was looking for a towel, you know, for my little booth out here. They give out robes here. You guys are awesome. Like, it must be cold. Get down in that water. Somebody came up afterwards, and they're like, yeah, when they come up out of the water, they got this look on their face. I'm like, yeah, they're stunned. They can't breathe. <laughs> Church is like, praise the Lord. <laughs> First, we want to hear your story. I want to hear your story because I care. You know, someone, even in between services, and I don't know who they were, but they, they came up and they said, hey, I think I want to get baptized, but... I want to check first and make sure that I'm right with God. I love that. Absolutely. So the second thing is, we're not in a rush around here. We don't have a baptismal tank. We're not going to rush you through the water. We're going to watch you for a while. We want to watch you walk a little. We want to see, hey, is this a legit thing? Or was this, you know, you had to take some Tums and you showed up at church. And, you know, we want to hear your story. And we're okay. We want to walk with you. We want to walk with you. Because baptism is special. Second, why, why do we get baptized? Um, I'm going to flip over to Matthew 28. A lot of you are familiar with this passage. I'm going to start it's the, at the very end of the book. <clears throat> Pull it up on your phone. I'm going to look at verses 18 through the end. And I started with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Before his ministry, the first thing he did when he went public was he got baptized. Then he went out into the wilderness, and he was tempted, and then it was game on with his ministry. Here we have the bookend with Matthew. It says in verse 18, <clears throat> And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why do we practice baptism? Three reasons. I'm going to give them up front, and then I'm going to talk through them. First, Jesus commands it. Matthew 28, Jesus commands it. Second, it's a sign to the community. It, it is something to celebrate. And third, it's an act of obedience. Again, it doesn't save you. There's nothing in the water. I had a pastor there like, when you go into that Baptist tank... You're getting wet. That city water. I don't know what it would be. Well water up here. That's well water. It's coming right out. There's, there's nothing. But it is three things. Jesus commanded it. It's a sign to the community. And it's an act of obedience. Here in the end of Matthew, Jesus, some of his last words to his followers, he commands them to baptize. You know, a lot of us are familiar with this, but we've never studied, like, why that? Like, if it doesn't save you, why, why is that important? Notice here at the end of the book, it's the Trinitarian confession. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. The context of the New Testament is 
These are Jews. They believe in the Father. The majority of them did not believe in the Son. They crucified Him. They rejected Him. Some believed. Peter was a Jew. James and John, they were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And with baptism, it is what you are proclaiming is, I am following Jesus. I believe in the Father, I believe in the Spirit, and I believe in Jesus. It would have made them different than their Jewish brethren. The Jewish brethren would have watched and said, yeah, we heard of Jesus, who is this guy? On Pentecost, when the Spirit fell and they were like, what is going on? It identifies baptism, identifies as different. You know, in this passage, the emphasis on this passage is actually make disciples. It is the imperative verb. Got any English teachers in here? <clears throat> okay. Check it. Grammar is not quite my thing. <clears throat> you know, actually, I got out of um, high school and college, and I was like, great, I'm never going to have to do that again. You know, the first thing you do in Greek and Hebrew? Grammar. I was like, part of what? Participle? Like, I th I that's been 20 years. Okay, this passage... The imperative word is make disciples. There's three participles for you English nuts. Go, baptize, and teach. They are descriptions of what making a disciple looks like. As you are going, baptizing, teaching everything I have commanded you. Before they were baptized, they knew Jesus. Jesus first. Baptism second. Jesus' followers are commanded to baptize second. It's a sign to the community. It's an outward sign of an inward confession. We saw last week in Acts chapter 2, 41, that 3,000 came to Christ. If you go back and look at verse 41, immediately they were baptized. <clears throat> when you travel to Israel and you go up to the Temple Mount, you're in the heart of Jerusalem. And... There's space, but it's like a city, and it's open. And Peter would have gotten up on the day of Pentecost, and he would have preached, not, not really a toe stepper, more like an eye gouger. Like, he was really going at the crowd. He's like, you guys crucified the Messiah. You missed Jesus. And 3,000, the word repent means to change your thinking, to change your mind. 3,000 accepted Christ, and immediately they baptized them. Can you imagine, like, middle of Jerusalem, Jews, all of they're baptizing. They're doing Matthew 28 in, in Acts 2. <coughs> it was a sign to the community. It was a sign. Now, 3,000 is a megachurch in my mind. <coughs> Excuse me. There's also instances of Scripture where the crowd's not so big. If you remember, Philip, the evangelist, gets taken and he, he meets an, a, an Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot out in the middle of nowhere. He's reading Isaiah. He, he's trying to understand it. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, no. How can I understand it unless someone explains it? Philip says, well, let me explain it. He tells him about Jesus. He accepts Jesus there. And then, apparently, there was water. If you go down into the south the Judean desert in Jerusalem, there's barely any water. There was water. He goes, hey, what should keep me from getting baptized? And right there, Philip baptizes this guy. Why do we get baptized? First, Jesus commanded it. Second, it's a sign to the community. And third, it's an act of obedience. It's just, it's just a step. It's part of your faith. You know, God calls us to be obedient to a lot of things. I just saw deer walking out there. That's, I'm still getting used to that. <clears throat> Makes me want to go hunt. Okay. Back. It's an act of obedience. It's a first step. And, you know, people have hang-ups on baptism. You know, for as many people as are out there, everybody's got something different. Like, I don't know. I don't know, Michael, if I want you to baptize me, you about knocked your wife out. Go put you in a river with me. I don't know. 
you know, there's different things. But, you know, I've had the privilege of going to Africa a couple times. I've been to the Middle East, to Turkey. You know, in Africa, when they baptize, they go to the local community where the, the lake or the river is. And all the community, it'd be like all of Bailey coming out. And you know, in those communities, not everybody knows Christ. There's Muslims, there's witch doctors, there's different faiths. And you know, when, when that individual that's accepted Christ goes down into that muddy, because there's no clean, that mud hole, and the pastor, the elder, calls out in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that person's life is marked forever in the community. They could lose their home. They could lose their family. And what they are doing is they're saying, I am going to so identify with Christ that I am willing to take this risk. When I went to Turkey, we worked with Persian refugees that had come across from Iran. They had walked across the mountains. Everyone that I met who knew Christ had had someone in their immediate family killed by the secret police because they were Christians. There was a church of about 50, and when they would do baptisms, they would do it in a Muslim country in Turkey. They would do it in a bathtub, and you would get pictures with the eyes crossed out so you couldn't tell who it was because if they were found out, they ran the risk of imprisonment or being killed. You know, for us, and I'm thankful for this, we have much religious freedom here in the U.S., we can all go out on a Sunday out to the Platte River and eat a bunch of food and make a couple people really cold and celebrate that. But what we are doing is the same thing as our African brothers and our Turkish sisters in Christ. We are doing what's been done for 2,000 years and what Christ has called us to do to identify with him no matter what the cost. Why do we do it? Because we're called to obey. First pastor at, um, hmm, there's always a few of these in the church, uh, had a real spunky old lady. She was a spitfire. She must have been early 80s. She made it up into her 90s. Her name was Rosemary. She'd outlived one or two husbands. She loved life. I can't share half the stories because they would make me blush and they just, she was the one that would talk at the pastor at the inappropriate moment. She'd say the little thing that was just a little off that everybody thought was hilarious, but you wouldn't say. You know, when you get in your 80s, you can do that. You just, you do it. <laughs> I always came in, and I'd always give Rosemary a hug. She's about this tall. She weighed about a, she was about a buck wet. She's just tiny. And... Um, Rosemary grew up religious in church. I don't know if, if she was Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. You don't know what I'm talking about. Don't worry about it. But she didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. She'd had church. And at this church, she heard the word and the spirit moved. And in her 80s, she accepted Christ as her Savior. And everybody knew it because <laughs> Rosemary just let everybody know everything. And, uh, you know, there were, there were three young pastors. We were young. We didn't quite, quite know what to do. And Rosemary was like, well, I've got Jesus now. I'm good. I ain't not getting baptized. You're not putting me in that tank. And we're like, come on, Rosemary. What's up? She's like, well, one, I mean, I'm an old lady and my back hurts. We're like, no, we got, we're, you know, three young seminarians, you know, new pat. We, we got everything here. We'll put a chair in the baptistry, right? You can sit in the chair and we'll just kick out the back legs and bring you up. And she's like, nah, that's not it. I, just, I could just hear her. Like, she's like, that's not the big deal. I was lying to you. Um, she's like, it's my hair. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of you got grandmas that are in their 80s, but man, once or twice a week when it's hair day, you don't mess. It was her hair. Well, that only took three seminarians, you know, couple months we finally came back to her like hey we'll get you a shower cap it may have actually been like one of those swimmer caps you know the type and that was good she was good we got her in the tank rosemary boom church 
loved it. And rightly so. Jesus had done a work. It was an outward sign of an inward confession that at 80, Jesus was still in the business of saving lives. And I tell you, I want to spend, when I get up to, Rosemary's gone to be with Jesus. I look forward to seeing her again someday. All right, what is baptism? Baptism is an identifying or an outward confession. Second, why do we get baptized? Jesus commanded it. It's a sign to the community. It's an act of obedience. Now, how? Let me say this first. Again, there's a lot of latitude in Scripture. And there are good brothers and sisters in Christ that would probably believe different things than we do. And that's okay. That's okay. Jesus remains the main thing. It's faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. But when it comes to how we baptize, I I, I know I sound like a broken record, but it's not part of our conversion. It's part of our confession. Jesus is who changes us. But when we identify him, baptism is the act where the world, our friends and our family can see it. Baptism is one of two ordinances Some of you may have grown up in a stream of Christianity that used the term sacraments, ordinance, sacraments. Next week, we're going to look at communion. Here at Crow Hill, we believe in two ordinances. Both were put, instituted by Christ. One was baptism and the other is communion. We do that on the first Sunday of each month. We'll look at that next week. Baptism is not salvation. Salvation is by grace alone through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Baptism doesn't save us, it's just an act of obedience. It is instituted by Jesus for the church to both identify and align with her. Here at Crow Hill, we don't baptize infants. I, there are good brothers and sisters in Christ who do. For us, we see an order. What I see in Scripture is that salvation always precedes baptism. I'll give you a personal example. I came to Christ when I was five. That's fairly young. My parents waited till I was nine for me to be baptized. They wanted to make sure that I understood that it wasn't getting wet in the baptistry or all the fanfare and everybody being excited. We don't do infant baptism. Sometimes I think infant baptism comes because Jesus was dedicated. We will do baby dedications. I would love to dedicate any of your kids... I've dedicated young and old. I will require that they have a little name tag with their name on it pinned to them. I always get a little nervous dedicating kids, and I want to get the name right. But Jesus was dedicated. He wasn't baptized. Matter of fact, when Jesus went to the temple to be dedicated, on the eighth day he was circumcised. We don't want to confuse circumcision and baptism. But sometimes, I'm afraid that we read it in here and we get a little turned around. We're like, well, Jesus was baptized. No, he wasn't. He was circumcised, and we, don't, we won't do that. You got to go talk to your GP. <laughs> we also baptize by immersion. Again, it's what we feel that we see in Scripture. It's interesting. If you talk to somebody that's grown up in a stream of Christianity, or you know someone that's been sprinkled, We go to the same text to argue, so that's great. (laughs) But here, we baptize by immersion because we feel that that is the example that's set in Scripture. Let me give you three. One, the Jews historically immersed. That's pre-Jesus. Jesus was immersed. And when we look at the book of Acts, we see story after story of individuals who have accepted Christ and are immersed. A story. When I was in college, I went to a wonderful church. It was a Presbyterian church. They sprinkled. had a little 
little dish and they would, they would sprinkle. I had the privilege of leading an individual. Um, his name was Zay de Christ while I was in Purdue. And this was the only church home he had ever known. It's a wonderful church, godly church. The pastor was faithful to preach the word. They loved Jesus, everything you'd want. <clears throat> and he realized that he hadn't been baptized, and he asked if the church would baptize him. And I remember sitting, I was back, I always sat on the right side for some reason. And I remember the Sunday, Zade got up in front of the church, 1,500 people, it's a lot of people. And Zade shared that he had accepted Christ as his Savior and wanted to follow in baptism, and the pastor baptized him, and I was excited for him. A couple years later, Zade had moved from college, and he found a new church home. They were Baptist. He didn't know what that was. <clears throat> he said, Michael, these Baptist folks, he called me. I was in seminary at the time. He said, hey, they'd like me to get immersed. They want to dunk me. I said, yeah, they're Baptist. He said, I, I've been sprinkled. I've been baptized. I came to Christ, and I said, you have. He said, what should I do? I said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you see, it's understanding. It's the lack of confusion. It's the order that I want to put the emphasis on. And I don't know where all, how all you all grew up, but it's coming to Christ, and then it's getting baptized. I did give Zayd a piece of advice. I said, hey, Zayd, is it a good church? He said, yeah. I said, do they preach the word? Yep, pastor preaches the word. They make a big deal about Jesus? Yes, they do. I said, well, I know you haven't run into these Baptist folks before, but here's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. That's a good church. And if you get baptized and they dunk you, that's not going to negate the fact that you were sprinkled by a good Presbyterian church. What it actually does is it honors your new church home. And I think Jesus would be good however he leads your conscience. I'm not going to tell you what he did. <laughs> Got to leave a little tension in the sermon. <clears throat> what is baptism? It is an outward sign of an inward confession. Why do we get baptized? It's an act of obedience. How? We do it in order. A relationship with Jesus first, then baptize. I want to go back to my wife. I asked her permission to share this. When you hear Catherine's story, she grew up in a Christian home that was in church. And um, Catherine professed that she knew Christ as a young girl. But she, looking back, realized that she didn't. She didn't have a story of coming to Christ before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ. And at 16, she went to a camp. And she had some adults that loved her real well, and they listened to her. And it was there, 16, 17, that she accepted Christ as her Savior. Fast forward half a lifetime. The pastor's wife, I'm going to baptize my daughter. And Catherine, and if you know Catherine, she's spunky. She don't care. You can bring it. She'll, she'll give it right back. Makes a great pastor's wife. She said, Michael, I think I need to get baptized. I said, what? I said, honey, we go to a Baptist church. They're going to they're gonna talk. I knew she wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> she said, I don't care. She said, I've been praying about this for a while, and I think I'm out of order. I think I came to Christ. I was baptized after I was five, but I didn't know Jesus yet. I came to Christ when I was 16, so I think it would be good for me to get baptized. I said, let's go. So there I am, baptistry tank, daughter, whoosh, wife comes down. Don't, I don't move. I go down. Her head's going to hit the baptistry. I lean back, dunk her under. She doesn't know, they don't know, my lower back knows. <laughs> she felt convicted. I love that. She was obeying her Savior. The 
church could talk, her husband could knock her out, whatever. (laughs) An outward sign of an inward confession. Hey, I'll, I'll make this promise to you. If the Lord moves to have you get baptized sometime at Crow Hill, I won't knock you out. We will make a big deal of it. But do you know who makes the biggest deal? It's Jesus. You're following in his footsteps. You're obeying him, no matter what the cost. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for both the freedom that your scripture gives and how it's direct. I thank you that for over 2,000 years, followers of Christ have been identifying with your son through baptism. Whether it be in a bathtub, a frozen lake, a baptistry, what they are proclaiming is that Jesus saves. Steps into the lives of 80-year-olds and you stepped into the life of a five-year-old. Lord, may we be faithful both with the big and the little, all to the glory of Jesus. Amen. Oceans rise, my soul will rest in your.
My soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you. Are. It's been a privilege to be able to worship with you this morning. Um, in a minute, at the end of our service, we'll have a prayer team down on each side. If there's anything that you would like prayed for confidentially, we'd love the privilege of talking with you and the Lord about it. Also in the back, there's two boxes. That's where we give. It's an act of worship. Everything we have is from the Lord, and it's our opportunity to give back to Him. Grab some M&Ms on your way out. The uh, booths are going to be open for about another 10 or 15 minutes, and... Um, be bold. Sign up. I, we were praying this morning that God would just connect dots and put the right people and connect with who he wants. So don't be bashful. It doesn't, it doesn't commit you. It just puts you on people's radar. If you don't take the M&Ms, I'm going to eat them, and that means I have to run more. So take the M&Ms. And now a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in his peace. <laughs>